South Africa has the highest number of HIV and AIDS cases in the world, where nearly one in five people is HIV positive. In Soweto, South Africa's most densely populated township, the burden of disease falls on the township's only hospital, Chris Harney Baraguana. Dr. Alan Peter is a consultant at Barra. Head of Ward 20, he oversees every non-surgical medical emergency. Ward 20 is basically the medical emergency admission ward for any adult over the age of 14 who comes in with an acute medical problem. We're doing post intake ward rounds, so all the patients that are seen acutely will come in, they'll be seen by an intern and a registrar. The job of the consultant is just to have a senior opinion on the patient. Yeah, okay. Alan's first patient has AIDS. He's reacted badly to the medication given to treat the disease and is back in hospital seeking help. We queried lactic uh, due to the ARVs. It becomes significant when the lactate level is above five. Sure. Okay. I've been at Barra since 98 and still love the place. I think the motivation for staying at Barra Gwanath is that you're serving in a community where there are very few doctors. One f has a deep sense of being needed and making a positive contribution to the lives of so many people who are desperately poor and who suffer enormously without complaining. The patient Alan next sees also has full-blown AIDS. Just have a quick look at you. Come here, the bulk of our burden is HIV infectious related diseases and it's just a tsunami that's affected us. So, so far we've got two out of two who've been HIV positive. We're not equipped to cope with it. We started our handing out of ARVs far too late because of the maverick of views of people in government service and administration. Antiretrovirals, or ARVs, are the drugs used to treat AIDS. The AIDS epidemic has just grown in those number of years unabated. <laughs> We're still going to feel the effects of that as the people who are infected now present 10 years down the line. Look at your finger. 50 to 60% of hospital deaths in the medical ward are HIV related. Can you try? Let's sit you up. Hold on. Let's go. Good man. I chose medicine to deal with compassion, healing, and love of my brother and sister. A visit to the doctor is a visit that one remembers for the rest of your life. That sounds normal. Okay. Sabonam Kulu. Alan's next patient was brought in unconscious the night before. An elderly man, doctors suspect a bleed on the brain. So far, the man hasn't responded to any treatment. I'm going to rub on his sternum. It's, it sounds very cruel, but it's a painful stimulus. Let's just try and see if he, can, if, he, if he reacts to pain. He's not opening his eyes at all to pain, and he's not moaning or making any sounds. The outlook is not good for the old man. The team must make some critical decisions right regarding his bit. care. We'll do a CT scan. And the reason for doing a CT brain is if you're going to compassionately withdraw therapy, you've got to justify doing so by having a large intercerebral event. Alan tells his interns He's that the old man is not for resuscitation yeah? and that chances are he will quietly slip quite away. On his way to a teaching round at Ward 20 is Professor David Blumson, a legend among the doctors and students at Barra. During his years at the hospital, Professor Blumson has seen it all. I was an intern here in 1955. I've worked here for many years, 50 plus years. The situations were was dreadful, deplorable, despicable, disgusting through apartheid years. And to my sadness, it certainly hasn't improved. Listen to the sounds of Baraguanath. 
He sounds like a poor man. He needs help. He was admitted and doesn't seem to have been followed up. So he was in renal failure. Even then, we don't know what plans they made to follow him up. We really don't know. He's desperately ill. His only hope is dialysis. The long term, we don't know. These are the ladies who take blood. Our good phlebotomists. How are you, Professor? I'm all right. How are you guys? I love patients. It makes me very humble, actually, to see how trusting they are. The patients are my heroes, actually. I think they are wonderful people. They deserve better than they get in a hospital of this nature. Professor Blumson is passionate about the hospital he has worked in for so many years and continues to be outspoken about many of Barra's policies. Good morning, good morning, Baba. I think that we discharge patients far too early. I don't know whether they are really ever followed up. The patients flounder because it's not a very patient-friendly hospital. The government needs to take notice. They don't take us seriously. It's not important. That regardless is not important. What is it? It's also yeah, early. She has also premature. premature. She has Saving lives. <laughs> I love teaching and I'll stay here as long as I can. As long as they'll have me and as long as I'm able to do it. Somebody once said, never despair, but if you do, work on in despair. And many of our people are doing just that. Dr. Tina Ingrata is a registrar in Ward 20. She is going to see Professor Blumson, her friend and mentor. How are you? Me personally? Yes, you are. Well. How are you? No, good. Blumson tutors Tina and many other young doctors yeah, at Barra. Nice ECGs, they're under there. Under here? Mm -hmm. It's right at the top of that. There we go. There are two ECGs. Just little strips of ECGs. What are they? What should we do for that patient? We just place this guy in a big hurry. <laughs> it's a complete hot lock. How fast? It's going at about 24 beats something a minute, like something like that. This patient needs a pacemaker. In a hurry. In a hurry. Next patient. Blumson has experienced all the frustrations that working at Barra brings and offers a sympathetic ear. I had a nightmare of a call on, on Wednesday night. I was alone with the intern and we saw 40 patients between the two of us. And I went home yesterday and I thought, oh, I can't do this again. And I had some sleep and I saw my family and I came back today and I thought, renewed. I can't not do this again. Renewed and refreshed. Very much so. Prof, thanks. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Very I've got a couple of ECGs I need to discuss with you. He's been here forever and he's made such a huge difference to our medical department. Very fondly known as the conscience of Barra. Quite like that term, it's very accurate for him. Everybody knows him, they should write books on him, he's been great and he's been one of my mentors and favorite people here at Barra. Back in Ward 20, Alan continues his rounds. Um, abdominal examination. And he's got quite a remarkable chest x-ray. Does he know his HIV status? No, he doesn't. We're going to have to use an interpreter because okay. the percentage was unknown. Many right. patients have not been tested for HIV and are often afraid to know their status. Alan suspects tuberculosis in his next patient. TB attacks those with immune systems compromised by HIV and AIDS. Consequently, South Africa also has one of the highest TB rates in the world. Nearly every single patient we've seen, we virtually try to exclude TB, a TB and pneumonia the biggest lung infections in HIV. And as the TB grabs hold of them, the HIV immunity drops even further. Perfa, perfa. Okay, if you look at your x-ray, this x-ray, it's nice and clear. It must be black like this. Here we have his illness here. And in a normal chest x-ray, there's no pattern in the lungs. And if the patient can see that, he'll understand and consent to invasive tests, which are uncomfortable. That's why we want you to cough. Nicely. Alan takes time to explain the patient's condition to him. He agrees to the procedure. I mean, we see the smile on his face. He's recognized that he's ill, um, and we're going to try and do something about it. 
The young interns have nearly finished their handover round. They have worked over 20 hours and are exhausted. My junior staff have been working hard the whole night. I have the luxury of coming and smelling of Old Spice and saying these nice things. <laughs> these guys are the ones that are dead on their feet. I've had many interns come through my hands. They've always delighted to leave Barra because of the high workload. And it's not long after how they all tell us how they miss this place. <laughs> the camaraderie in this hospital is fantastic. The friendship between the staff members is extraordinary in this hospital. I suppose the equivalent analogy is people in the First World War. When you share trench life together, you form friends for life. And this is it. Trench life against HIV. Alan ends another long day at Barrow. As evening falls, the overnight staff prepare to take over. At Chris Harney Baragwanath Hospital, Tina begins her overnight shift in Ward 20. She will be the only senior doctor on duty tonight. And in this ward, the work never ends. Um, there's six cubicles, essentially. Four of them are run by medical doctors. One's a high care facility, and cubicle F is our psychiatric facility. Uh, pretty much casualty screens through here, brings all the medical patients through here, and then we sort them out. You're the doctor, you're the nurse, you're the student. You do absolutely everything. We put drips, we put catheters, we wheel patients around. We fetch scans, we, we pretty much do anything. Um, and you actually get used to it, and you get pretty good at being quite efficient. Average day is about 150 admissions to this area, and that's looked after by about eight doctors. So the workload is enormous. We service about a population of five million people. I don't know if which ones you want to see. These are all chronics, let yes. We train our interns here, we train students here, we train foreign doctors here. Ward 20, if you want to learn, this is where you come and learn. She's a good rate, she loves her work, um, she gives it her best, basically. That's Tina for you, she goes all out for it. If they learn something from me and they can tell me 20 years down the line, hey man, you taught me something, that's cool. Kambule, I think it's you in the corner there. He's an 86-year-old gentleman who's presented with a three-week history of uh, cough, a bit of shortness of breath over a very short distance, and some loss of weight. Is he had always TB gehad. He TB. When? 1987. Come, it's eight. I say, who's? Yeah. What's the clear? Is that? Is that green? Is that green? He's had TB before, and he used to smoke quite significantly. Just on history, I'm going to be looking for cancer. Lung cancer is actually very rife in our population. I'll ask him for me. Main reason for that is that people wait too long before they come to hospital. By the time they get to us, it's already advanced and late. You can see, can you see the pitting that I'm getting in the leg? He's got edema in his lower limbs. Along with all the standard tests, HIV testing is routine for all patients at Baraguana. I'm going to have to do an HIV test on him. Age is not a criteria yet, at Barra. You see HIV from birth up to the oldest patient I've seen is 100. You see in Ward 20 we do what we can on admission because otherwise to get stuff done later is always a bit of a mission. So everybody gets x-rays, bloods, we do as much as we can. But the main thing in Ward 20 is just you know, organisation, having stock of stuff. We often run out of stuff. I would love more doctors, I'd love more space. On top of managing with insufficient numbers of staff and resource shortages, Tina is struggling to deal with more patients than she can cope with. So, so what's happening here? We haven't got any space left. When we phone through with distress calls and say that we're busy, uh, please try to not send through patients that are not urgent. They kind of don't really heed our warning. A lot of these people are not that sick. They can be see at clinics. And then they send them to us in the middle of the night. So I'm going to phone and have a word with the casualty officer. Uh, the urgent directs I don't mind. But all this chronic nonsense is just backing me up and I really have no space left. And it's half past 12, you know, we've got another eight hours to go. Where am I going to put the really urgent patients? Ah, I said they didn't know. 
Tina is worried about a young girl who's just been admitted. This girl, I honestly don't know what's wrong with her. So I'm going to have to get an urgent brain scan. All I know is she's pale and she's confused and that she's got some liver dysfunction. Usually by the next day we kind of have some idea of what's going on with these patients. But she's really sick and can't attend to her fully, which is very frustrating. I've got an urgent direct next door. I'm going to go there. This is for that guy. Yeah, Miss Alida Fale. Tina is called away to diagnose another patient. Pretty much we're trying to rule out meningitis. So we're going to just put a small needle in the back. Uh, this is usually done under local anaesthetic. It's equivalent to an epidural, except with an epidural you go into the layer outside, we go into one slightly inside to that. And the fluid that comes out is clear like water, unless it's very infected that it's yellow or it's bloody if there's a bleed. <laughs> you see why well, we prefer to use local. <laughs> Sorry, sister. Lack of resources prohibits the use of local anaesthetics for such a procedure. Already overloaded, this is an added frustration for Tina. Sometimes we struggle like this, so I'm just going to try and make it easier by sedating her. Every now and then, you just get humbled by a procedure. It's just one of those things. Before Tina can finish the diagnosis, she is told the young girl she saw earlier is in trouble. She's already dead. So, so when did you notice? How long ago did you notice? Mm. She had platelets of seven, the haemoglobin of four. <laughs> Looked like severe sepsis. We did what we could. She had no chance. I just come too late. Sister, she's demised. She's already cold. You know, it's actually bad. Some of them you feel and some of them you don't. This is one of those where I knew she was going to die, so I was already prepared. I just didn't expect it tonight. I thought she would die tomorrow. C'est la vie. It's halfway through the night shift in Barra's Ward 20, where most of the hospital's seriously ill patients are admitted. The staff has just dealt with the death of a young girl. It's the middle of the night, but things are never quiet here for long. I'm going to give you something now for pain. I want you to relax. I want you to relax. Hi, AB, you're being a drama queen. You were fast asleep 10 minutes ago. I don't want you to scream, please. You're making everybody yeah, upset. Abby, 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 yeah, you're not a child. Yeah, don't scream. You're making yeah. everybody upset. I'm yeah. getting you something for pain in five seconds, yeah. okay? Okay, okay. Oh. Tina moves on to check on a woman who has HIV. HIV is just one of those things that's rampant at Barra, and there's very little that's being done, and we are so past the boat. We're in serious trouble in South Africa. Um, this lady's got renal failure, kidney failure, basically. The woman's condition has deteriorated quickly. It's not looking good. Let's just discuss with the renal doctors if they're going to do any dialysis. Tina calls a specialist to discuss the woman's case. We've got a patient here who's a known renal patient, Louise. She's HIV positive. She because the woman is uh, HIV positive, years. she will not qualify yeah, for dialysis now, at Barra's renal unit. OK, thanks, Chuck. Without dialysis, she has no hope of survival. Hello. How are you feeling today? Uh, You're feeling As fine. the night wears Besides on, Tina makes her way right. through the patients needing her attention. You're not feeling short of breath. Where's your oxygen? Uh, yeah, but there's uh, the red. Yeah, but you need it. You're blue, ne? 
Your lung is destroyed on the right. You've got one lung and it's You get used to standing for 15 hours without a break. It's very commonplace at Barra. The left lung is damaged. You understand? Just a bit tired, eh? Every time you're on night duty, it's like this. You have to double check yourself because you tend to make mistakes. Mama, yeah! Mama, yeah! Mama, yeah! Yeah! A nurse arrives with painkillers, bringing temporary peace to the ward. I've got a patient who's on a ventilator and he's not doing so well. He took an overdose. His family was quite distressed. He's not doing well. He's ventilated and he's not waking up, which is a very poor sign, but we're going to push on at least for 24 hours before we make a decision. That's kind of our policy. We do see many suicide attempts, various age groups, white, black, coloured, no class. In South African society, the stress, we don't really cope well with it at all. So people just have some kind, have to have some outlet. And taking tablets or landing up in hospital, it seems to do the trick. Now it's quarter to seven. And I'm supposed to be ready to walk around with my patients in half an hour. And all I can actually think about is breakfast. <laughs> I just need to eat something. Okay. So we're just going to lift him straight up. Okay. One, two, three. My interns worked hard. They worked really hard, which is nice. Do you want to try from there? Do you want to let me just go? Okay. Ammonia, bed sores, meningitis, TB. Pick an option, he's got all of them. I'm just exhausted. What can I say? I'm only human. So we must just keep. Uh, we really don't work for the money. People who think we do have got the wrong idea. Medicine, you work because you love it. You do often end up staying here quite late every day and it does sort of get under your skin. What's your name, sir? Every day I feel like I've done something well. And if it's just, I help just one person and that's enough for me. I love Barra, I love the people, I love the way it works. I love the way it doesn't work. And I think if it ran well, I wouldn't appreciate it quite as much as I do.